Welcome to today's webinar on new security features in ER Oracle eBusiness Suite 12.2. My name is Phil Ryman. I'm the Director of Business Development at Integrity. I'll be monitoring this evening session. Speaker today is Stephen Kauf. Steve is the Chief Technology Officer and Founder of Integrity Corporation. He's been working with Oracle products since 1994 with responsibilities that include database administrator, technical architect, IT security auditor, and applications administrator. In the past 14 years, Steve has focused on the security and auditing aspects of the Oracle Business Suite and the Oracle Database, and has written and presented on these topics at various national and regional conferences. Steve is recognized nationally for his vast security knowledge and expertise. So welcome, Steve. Thanks so much, Phil. And today we're going to talk about securing the Oracle eBusiness Suite and all the new security features that are in Oracle eBusiness Suite 12.2. And so basically what we did was we worked with 12.2. Um, we've gone through all the release notes. We've actually got it installed and running and actually gone through and kind of poked at it, played with it, and found out things that work well, things that don't work well, and things that you should be actually implementing in your future environment. Before we get into Oracle Business Suite 12.2, a uh, brief background about Integrity for those of you not familiar with us. I know many people on the call today uh, attend a lot of our webinars. Uh, but we specialize in Oracle Business Suite security and database security. Uh, we do that two ways. We have a set of products, one app sentry that helps scan your eBusiness Suite environment, including 12.2, to make sure it's secure, that all the security configuration settings are done properly. You've got security patches applied, database passwords are not set to default. And we also have a product called AppSen that acts as an enterprise application firewall. So if you're deploying eBusiness Suite to the internet, uh, running modules like iSupply or iStore, iRecruitment, it helps add another layer of protection. And then we also do on-site security services, uh, security assessments, design services. And a lot of the material that we do in our webinars comes from our security services where we're on-site with a customer and we kind of find out things that they're doing that aren't as secure as it should be and we kind of include that back into our webinar. So a lot of the information we present is really based on true experience with a lot of different clients that we work with. So enough about Integrity, let's talk about Oracle eBusiness Suite 12.2. I will start off with a brief overview of 12.2, some of the major technology changes and kind of have security impacts. And then we'll talk about some changes with the application security. And then we'll talk about WebLogic, which is one of the major technology stack changes uh, for this release. And talk a little bit about web security and then open it up for questions and answers at the end. Uh, feel free, anytime you have a question, just enter it in the go to meeting questions box and we'll try to answer it during the session and also at the end. So let's get started talking about eBusiness Suite 12.2 at a high level. So this is somewhat of a major release for Oracle. And what I'll first do is kind of give you a little bit of feedback on who's planning to upgrade. Uh, we always get this question is, okay, what other clients do you have upgrading to these different versions and things? So during the registration, there was actually a question, uh, when is your organization planning to upgrade to 12.2? And so we kind of compiled the results from all the different registrations. And so it does show in the next two years, about 20 to 30% of you on the call today are planning to upgrade. Uh, I found it kind of interesting that 12% of the people on the call I uh, have no plans to upgrade, but they're still on the call, which was very interesting. And 42%, the vast majority, actually have not made a decision yet. So you're probably still evaluating, looking at 12.2, uh, what it offers you in terms of both functionality, security, technical enhancements. So now you're thinking about 12.2. At least you're hopefully trying to make a decision. The vast majority of you are at least looking at it, looking to do something with it. Um, there's a couple major technology stack changes. Um, at the database level, not much has changed, uh, but in terms of the application server, Oracle has now replaced the Oracle application server 10G with the Oracle Fusion middleware 11G, which involves a lot of the web logic components that they bought uh, when they purchased BEA. Uh, so this is a big change. Uh, we'll actually talk about some of the security implications about this. This has actually expanded the footprint of the application quite a bit in terms of what the application server can do. Uh, the Fusion middleware has even more expanded capabilities than the application server uh, 10G. If you thought there was a lot of stuff in application server 10G, there is a lot more in Fusion middleware. 
So when we're talking about it from a security perspective, we're always looking at the attack surface. What is going on in the application? What can somebody potentially exploit? And in this case, that one of our concerns is, hey, there's a lot more you can do with Fusion Middleware 11G. There's a lot of uh, web services, um, service-oriented architecture components. And so those are the type of things that we look at integrity is, okay, we've got Fusion Middleware now running. What's actually enabled? Uh, what can you use it for? Where can people get themselves into trouble? And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. The other significant change with 12.2 is online patching. And when we talk about different security aspects, complexity is always one area that we look at. Complexity and security are diametrically opposed. As you increase complexity of a system, you're um, by nature decreasing the security of it. As things get more complex, it is much more difficult to actually secure it and do what you should be doing with it. Um, online patching is an example of this. So now when we're <clears throat> using online patching, Oracle has dramatically reduced the downtime when you're applying patches. Well, what they've done to enable that is actually add in two new complex components to the overall architecture. The first being the database now uses addition-based redefinition. Um, so there's potential that there's actually two objects for every one in the database. So when you're actually doing patching and you actually update a table, you're actually almost mirroring that table um, with a view and then that table gets changed and so now you've got a dynamic view on top of the table. Um, you always have to use the app synonym. So there's a lot of different things going on uh, there. If you're actually updating a PL SQL package, now there's actually two versions of the same PL SQL package in the database with different versions. How does that impact security? And those are some of the questions that we're kind of tackling as we go through 12.2 and some live client environments to say, okay, yeah, this is how you can actually exploit it. Then the other aspect is there's actually now two full installs of the entire application server stack. Um, so you thought having one big Apple top was a problem before and having a big install of application server 10G. Well, now you've got two Apple tops. You've got two Fusion middleware installs. You've got two instops um, in your environment. And so what Oracle does is to allow online patching and to minimize downtime, you can't be patching the true Apple top. So what they do is now actually have two Apple Tops. You apply the patches to the patch install Apple Top and also do Fusion middleware updates and everything else there that applies to the application server. And then when you're ready to actually apply those patches and get those patches live, you have actually run all the AD patch, which is now called ADOP um, in 12.2. You actually run that ahead of time. You get all the code applied. Everything's ready to go. And what you do is just basically flip a switch and you bring down the your, your running eBusiness Suite environment and you flip a switch and say, okay, what was running is now the patch and the patch is now the run. Um, there's a pretty good white paper from Oracle and the documentation is pretty good on it. But basically you're just having two environments. You patch one and then when that's ready to go, you turn off the other one and turn on the new one. And they're called FS1 and FS2. And then after you're done patching, you basically synchronize them behind the scenes and get them both back up to speed so when you run the next patches, you're ready to go. But again, this is basically two Apple Tops running, addition-based rest redefinition in the database. So there's a lot more code, a lot more complexity in the environment. Um, and this is kind of where we're looking at saying, okay, how can we exploit this uh, from an attacker's perspective? Um, because while well, one system's not patched, one system is patched, um, is there anything left over, any artifacts and things like that. Um, so that's kind of with the online patching. We won't talk about that much more, but just to give you a flavor of what's in 12.2 from a technical perspective and where some of the security problems might lie. Another area is with autoconfig. Now that we've actually moved to the Fusion middleware in 12.2, autoconfig works a little bit differently. Uh, at Integrity, the, one of the reasons we really liked autoconfig before, especially if at all the different layers of the technology stack was it's a pretty fixed uh, definition. So all the configuration files are provided by Oracle and they provide you ways to add some customizations in. So if, with the Apache server you can actually do the custom.com file. So if you want to modify the way the Apache configuration works you can do that. But most of the configuration files were very fixed. So if Oracle had a security fix for something that involved a piece of configuration they would just basically change it in the configuration files, put out a patch as part of the tech stack, and actually then it would get applied. Well, for autoconfig, and when we now add in the different Fusion middleware components, some of those components are now outside the scope of autoconfig. So when I do the Apache configuration, 
that's part of the Fusion middleware now. Oracle delivers you the first Apache configuration, but it is no longer managed by uh, autoconfig. So any new changes, anything that's bad in there, and Oracle may have released a security fix, it becomes a little bit more complicated now to actually manage those security changes and things like that. Um, it also provides more capability for the DBAs and much easier for the DBAs to actually go in and change the web configuration components um, within Fusion Middleware Control, and I'll actually show you that to you in a few minutes. Um, but they can make those changes, they can make the environment less secure. It's not as much of a rigid uh, web infrastructure. Uh, for most of the application components and the database components, those are still managed using auto-config and work the same way. Um, but it's really the Fusion middleware is a pretty dramatic shift on how those configuration files are managed. So that's kind of a brief overview of 12.2. Um, so we kind of went through and looked at uh, just kind of some of the high-level architecture changes. Um, now let's start talking about the application security. Uh, fortunately, in the environment, there weren't really any significant changes in terms of roles, responsibilities, um, access control, uh, those type of things. Um, fairly stable on the release. Um, so there's just a few kind of pretty, some of significant changes, but not uh, dramatic. The first one is uh, flex field value set security. Uh, so in previous releases, Oracle had actually enabled um, flex field value security, which allowed you to take different values and assign them out to different users. So if you had um, accounting flex field and certain users could only use certain um, accounting values, you could actually do that. That was enabled. What, what was always missing and a lot of organizations were uh, struggling with it based on a segregation duties issue was actually the value sets. Um, so basically, you need one person to manage all your value sets. So even if it was HR, accounting, anything within the business suite, there was actually only one responsibility that could manage all those. So it was kind of one form, one user. So now Oracle's actually gone in and added uh, value set security, so you can actually now have segregation of duties in the management and maintenance of the flex field value sets. Uh, this is enabled by default. Um, and so actually when you first install 12.2 or you actually upgrade to it, it's actually enabled and no one has access. Um, so it's kind of an interesting. So if you try to go in and once you do an upgrade and you try to go actually try to manage a value, a flex field value set, uh, you won't actually have access to it. Um, so you actually have to explicitly grant access. And if you're not explicitly granted access, uh, you have no um, capabilities to manage those or make any changes or even actually view them. Um, access can be actually based on a number of different factors, user responsibility, role, application, or operating unit. Um, so it's pretty kind of, it's robust. Um, it takes a little bit of t time to get used to, um, but if you have this problem and you've been cited by your auditors for a lack of segregation to duties on some of the value sets, or you didn't want to open up the value sets, so actually it became a maintenance nightmare because there's only one person that could be uh, res responsible for doing a lot of the value set maintenance, um, this makes it easier. Because um, basically, when we look at the an example, it really improves the segregation of duties. So now we can take the different flex fields and value sets and say, okay, who should be managing those? So maybe for my accounting flex field, I want my general ledger super users to do it. Uh, but in HR, I want my HR super users to be able to manage only the HR flex field value sets. And so now I can actually do that with the uh, <clears throat> flex field value set security uh, capability. I can say, okay, based on responsibilities, um, operating units, um, or roles, I can actually segment that out and say, okay, these users can see and manage these flex field value sets. And in HR, only the HR users can manage the HR ones. Um, so this kind of fixes one of the segregation of duties issues that have been uh, nagging a lot of different Oracle uh, customers for a long time. Uh, the one problem with it, though, is Oracle didn't quite get it ready out of the box for 12.2, so there is a patch that's required, and you have to do some initial setup um, to allow it. So if you actually just, when you do your upgrade, um, and try to go into manage a flex field value set for the first time, actually you won't have access to it. Um, you actually have to go set it up. There is one responsibility um, that allows you to manage all flex field value sets no matter what. Um, so there's kind of a master responsibility that you can assign out um, if you don't want to spend the time and effort to actually set up uh, flex field value set security. Uh, 
Um, but it, it works fairly well and it kind of man it really solves the security problem that a lot of people have been facing. But in terms of overall security features, this is kind of the one major one at the application security level. Um, there weren't many other changes in 12.2. Um, so the way your responsibilities, functions, grants, RBAC, roles, that all works the same way. So the only major change uh, was with the value set security. So that's basically at a high level the major changes that were done at the application security level. Um, another a more technical change that the Oracle has introduced, and it's a basically a very good feature, and it's one at Integrity probably of all the Oracle 12.2 capabilities, allowed JSP list is the one that we would kind of say is our test our favorite. Um, this basically allows you to limit access to different JSP pages. Um, so if you look at the Oracle 12.2 install, there is 16,000 different JSP pages. So a JSP page is basically a web page. Uh, these pages are mostly used for non-OA framework type activities. So if you go to iStore and iSupplier, when you do the registration, the user will register and the first pages they hit are JSP pages before they use the OA framework. Um, so kind of a bit of a background, there's really two types of web, major web pages within the Oracle e Business Suite framework. The first is JSP pages. These are individual pages. Um, if you go to the, your URL and look in your browser, you'll see the different names. Um, basically, if it's a unique name, it's a Java server page. Um, otherwise, if it's an OA framework page, the page will always be OA JSP or RF JSP. Um, so there's kind of a combination of the two different pages. This only affects the individual web pages, the JSP pages. Um, so, but there are 16,000 of them. And so as an example, if you're running eBusiness Suite, you always have to remember that eBusiness Suite installs all code no matter what. So everyone on this call today is running iStore. They're running Oracle Student System. They're running CRM. They're running manufacturing. So they're running every single module. Even if you haven't installed, licensed, configured, or done anything with it, Every time you do an eBusiness Suite install, it installs all the code. And there is no way to get rid of code. You can't just go in and start deleting things haphazardly or say, oh, I don't want iStore. I don't, if we don't run it, so why would I have it running in my environment? Well, there's no way to do that. So basically, you've got a fairly large attack surface. So in this case, there's 37,000 web pages that somebody can access. Well, they may not be all configured. They may not be all working correctly because they're not configured. Um, but a lot of times there's still things you can do. Um, if there's a security vulnerability in an iStore web page, you're not running iStore, there's still a potential that somebody can exploit that vulnerability in your environment and access the database using the apps account if it's a SQL injection bug. And then I can actually, through an iStore page, and these are true vulnerabilities, I could actually access all your HR data. Um, because remember, anything runs as apps. So any of these web pages are actually running as the apps account. So anything the apps account has access to all these pages potentially do. And so if there's a security vulnerability in just one of those 16,000 pages, um, someone can basically access a lot of data in your environment. Um, so basically, the goal for security is always reduce the attack surface. So I want to basically limit access to everyone to exactly what you need. And if I'm running just one or two modules in your business suite, why should I have iStore running? Allow JSP list actually allows that capability to go through and say, OK, of those 16,000 pages, I only need maybe 10 or 20,000, or maybe 100 or 200 of those pages is all I need running. I don't need all those other modules like iStore. Um, anyone who's ever deployed eBusiness Suite to the internet, um, modules like iStore, iSupplier, iRecruitment, there's the URL firewall. This is basically the URL firewall, um, but for internal use. Um, so it's a little bit more uh, straightforward capability, the URL firewall. Um, is a fairly long list of rewrite rules. These is actually working as part of the application. Um, so basically, what it does is it gives you a list of allowed pages, and it's allowed JSP list. And so basically, it's a fairly rudimentary capability to do this. And so basically, it just gives you, and you list out every page that is allowed access. And then if it's, you're not allowed access, basically, um, it's blocked from being used. So iStore, you just basically put down what um, pages you want, and since iStore is not on the list, iStore would be blocked. And so it dramatically reduces the number of web pages in the environment. So you're going to go from 16,000 maybe to 1,000 or less. Um, in the base install of Oracle eBusiness Suite 12.2, it is not enabled, so it must be manually enabled. Um, the EBS security guide actually has very good instructions on how to enable it. 
uh, for the first time. Um, but this is one of those features that provides a tremendous amount of value from a security perspective um, because you're just reducing the attack surface of the application. So if someone can't access it, um, you're much less likely to be hacked. So in order to enable allowed GST pages, um, basically there's a new profile option call, um, called allow unrestricted GSP access. And so the default is um, yes. So basically everything will be allowed. Um, so if you want to use JSP lists, you basically turn it to no, and then there's new files in the FND top um, secure directory that basically look something like this and are basically just purely lists of all the JSP pages that are allowed to be run in your environment. Um, so in this case, this is the master file, and then this file calls other files based on different modules. So then based on which modules you're running, uh, you can go edit. Oracle gives you out a pretty good default list. And so if you're just running financials, you'd go comment out um, the HR line, the leasing line, the procurement line, the SCM, the CRM. You'd comment out all those lines. Um, so then that way those pages would not be allowed. Um, these are explicit allowed. So each page on this list um, says it's allowed. And so if we see pages here like OHSP, which is the OA framework page, yes, we definitely want to allow that one. Um, and so basically if it's not on the list, um, Oracle will block that page from running by default. Um, the best way to actually enable this for the first time is you run the application for a little bit, and then what you do is you can actually take the web access logs, and so from those access logs, it records basically every page that's ever been requested. Um, so then in those access logs, you can actually go through and parse them and actually get a unique list of the JSP pages that are allowed, and then you kind of compare it to these lists to make sure that everything's included. Um, the, really the ones that won't be included is if you've developed any custom JSP pages. Um, so if you have a customization, you've added a couple pages in um, for all kinds of different reasons. Some people like to make custom HR directories and things like that. Um, you'd actually have to add those manually to the list. Those are probably the one exception um, that won't be on the list. When we look through and kind of enable this testing, um, it worked fairly well. We never ran into a problem on a page that we wanted access or didn't want access that wasn't on their uh, standard list. Um, but remember, there's 16,000 pages in the environment and you're just trying to reduce the surface area. And a lot of those pages aren't needed. There's a lot of tests and debugging pages. Um, so if you go through the security vulnerabilities found over time, um, especially the ones that Integrity finds, we focus in on debug and test web pages in Oracle Business Suite, and there's hundreds of them. And those have a lot of different security vulnerabilities. Um, those aren't as well tested. They kind of sneak into the application. Somebody put them there uh, five years ago for some reason because some customer was having a problem, and they just stick around, and there's a lot of security vulnerabilities. Those don't go through the rigid QA that a standard page would be because everyone's accessing them, but if there's just a standard debug page or a test page that's sometimes in the documentation, um, those have a lot of security vulnerabilities. And that's why these allowed GSP lists will block a lot of those different pages. Um, so that's, this is the one feature that we really like. Um, again, it's reducing the surface area. It's getting rid of a lot of potential security vulnerabilities in the environment, both known and unknown. Um, so like as an example, uh, cmetest.jsp is a page that you should never really be accessing. It had a big security vulnerability a few years ago. Um, that was blocked by the standard Oracle configuration here. Um, so that's just kind of one example, and there's hundreds of those types of examples, and that's a great reason to enable it. So allowed JSP pages is not enabled by default, and we highly recommend you look at enabling it after you've got 12.2 running. So that was allowed JSP pages. Um, another area that we always run into significant findings when we do security assessments on site at our clients is default passwords. Um, Oracle Business Suite has almost 200 database accounts. Um, so as you remember, there's always one database account for each product schema. Um, so there's a general ledger account, an FAA account for fixed assets, AR for accounts receivable. Um, there's about 160 of those different schema accounts. There's standard Oracle database accounts. There's about 15 of those. There's apps and Apple Sys. So there's a lot of different database accounts in the environment. The problem in previous installs of Oracle Business Suite 1213 and prior, when you installed the database, every single database account had a default password. So the password you always knew for General Ledger, the account was GL, the password is always GL. 
Um, so unless you went through and specifically changed all those different passwords, uh, basically anyone could sign on as to the database as a general ledger account. And by the way, that account has enough privileges to actually access or execute any SQL in the entire database. Um, so basically, that's a pretty big security flaw. Um, and a lot of people didn't realize that they had to go change those passwords, or when you do upgrades, Oracle will add in a new product schema and doesn't document it in the um, upgrade instruction, so therefore now you've got a new default password. And since these are pretty well-known passwords, anyone can kind of run up to your production system, try each account once with the default password, find one to get in, they can get in, they can basically uh, steal all the data. As part of the 12.2 uh, fresh install, Oracle has added a new capability that changes all the default passwords upon installation. Uh, so we think this is a fairly significant improvement to hopefully eliminate default passwords, at least in uh, fresh installs. Um, the key is there's a lot of different passwords in these installs. So in this screen, as you can see, um, there's the WebLogic password. Um, so as part of the WebLogic administration, there's a new account, WebLogic. So that's got a default password you have to change. Um, the apps and Applesys pub passwords are always the same password. Um, so you basically set those. So now the apps password has unique password. Um, then there's all the sys and system accounts, um, CTX sys, outline. Um, there's 14 different standard database accounts installed in a fresh install of eBusiness Suite 12.2. Um, so those are all changed to the same value. Um, your DBAs really need to know the apps and system passwords. So the application DBAs always have to know those passwords. So whenever you run patching or anything, the first thing it does is ask you for the WebLogic password, the apps password, and the system password. And then finally, there's the product password. So each product schema, 161 total in a fresh install, all are there. And so you can actually change the password for those. Um, for all the other password values here that we're talking about, the first three, uh, the recommendation is you change them to a nice, strong password. Um, but it has to be something you know. When you actually set the product schema password, uh, what we recommend is actually you kind of just put in some nice, random, long, uh, password that you actually don't need to know. So once you set that, I would set that to a password that I really don't need to know, uh, put it in, put it in a second time to make sure it's confirmed, um, and then forget about it. Because those accounts are not logged in interactively um, by the DBAs except for rare occasions. Occasionally you have to load up message files in like a GL scheme or something like that. Um, but that's a very rare occasion and that's usually only one different, one schema and so if you have to do that, we recommend, well, if you don't know that, if you're not keeping that password, you're not storing that password, you can't lose that password. Um, so then if you have to reset the GL account, well, go temporarily reset it when you have to do something just to the GL schema and then set it back to a random password um, so you don't have to remember and store it. Because um, the only three passwords you really need, uh, or four passwords you need often in the business suite environment is the WebLogic password, the apps password, the sys, and the system password. Those from a DBA maintenance perspective, those are the four you need uh, frequently. Um, but here, at least you're now changing the password, you're getting strong passwords and hopefully avoiding the problem with default passwords in your environment. Uh, the one key default password still there is Apple Sys Pub. The password's always pub. Um, this account is very limited, but by the way, any account that can connect to the database, if you don't apply critical patch updates on a regular basis, and there's a vulnerability in a public package, even Apple Sys Pub can take over your entire database. Um, so we highly recommend you change the Apple Sys Pub password. Um, it is a multi-step process to change that password um, because it is managed by autoconfig. So you do have to change it in autoconfig, run autoconfig, um, and then actually change it at the database level um, to get everything synchronized. Uh, but we definitely recommend that's the one password now you have to focus in on in a fresh install of 12.2. Uh, the one nice thing we did being security guys, we had to test. Um, these password prompts also require strong passwords. Um, so that was actually a nice thing to see. Um, it's nice to be able to set the passwords originally, but when the user's going in and setting the apps password as apps, um, that can become a problem too. Um, so Oracle's at least improving requiring strong passwords to be set. So those are default passwords as part of a fresh install. Hopefully you've already changed all your passwords in your current eBusiness Suite environment, no matter what version you're running. Um, we often see that people don't. Um, we, do a set, we do quite a few assessments every year 
uh, at clients, and we find maybe one client a year that has actually doesn't have a single default password in their environment. Um, so it's very rare that we don't find one. One of the big areas where we do find passwords is whenever you do a Oracle Business Suite upgrade, it's adding in new uh, database accounts. And whenever it adds a new database account, it always adds in a default password. Um, so in this case, right in the middle there, one we find quite often because it was added as a separate patch, IZU, which is the database schema for uh, application diagnostics. All the passwords IZU. There was nowhere in the diagnostics patch that said a new database account was being added IZU with a default password IZU. So when DBA applied this patch, no one realized that a new database account was being created. Therefore, a new vulnerability was being introduced in the environment. So whenever you do an upgrade, a new database accounts, even in 12.2, are being added, and those have default passwords. So here's kind of the list we went through and looked at which database accounts are being added as part of different upgrades. So if you're upgrading to 12.2, these are the database accounts that would be added based on the version you're upgrading from. Um, so if you're upgrading from 12.04, you'll get, what, roughly eight new database accounts added um, because every time a new module is added, it will have a new database account. Um, so then you have to go back in your environment and make sure the passwords are changed for these. Um, Oracle's got the utility that is the DBA users with deaf password. Um, which is a really nice capability in the database. So if you want to see what default passwords you have, you just do select star from DBA uh, users underscore deaf password, and that will show you what passwords are default in the database. Unfortunately, that does not work for these newer accounts. Oracle made a static list about four or five years ago and has not routinely updated it. So if you're upgrading from 12.1.0 to 12.2, you're going to get a couple new accounts, and those are not on Oracle's list. So we always recommend that you use some other tool to look for the default account passwords in the environment. Um, our, our tool at Sentry does that. We look for default passwords, but we also try to break the passwords by trying different combinations, making sure it's not set to Larry, Welcome One, things like that. So our product at Sentry will go through and do a really rigorous check, um, much more so than the default Oracle prop tool uh, with it, that's supplied with the database. So that's default passwords for upgrades. Um, so this is an area that we always, when we do security assessments, find problems with. So it's one area that you need, do need to be looking at. So one of the big technology stack changes was web logic. For a security perspective, I would have to say it's kind of a neutral. Uh, is it improving security? Is it decreasing security? Are there security features in it? Are there security issues? It's more of a change than anything else, the way the application works. And the complexity now becomes that your DBAs really have to understand a whole other layer of the technology stack. Very few organizations we work with have DBAs and web application experts who work with eBusiness Suite. Almost everybody I've ever worked with going back 20 years working with eBusiness Suite is there's one applications DBA and he's responsible for the database and the application server. Well, now has finally come the time where I thought they always, the DBA has struggled a little bit with the application server. Now is when they're going to really start struggling because now the application server is fully exposed. It used to be something that if you just ran auto config, bring it up and down, you didn't have to work with it much. But today with the web logic in 12.2, you're really, it's right in your face, it's there, um, you're going to have to work with it. And so this will be a big change to the DBAs on how they work with it. And so from our perspective of security is, yeah, there's a lot of, it's improved security because it's a new version of the application server, um, but there's a lot more capabilities for the DBAs to kind of mess up, uh, make mistakes. Um, the configuration isn't as tightly controlled anymore from an auto-config perspective. And so basically what I'll do is we'll jump out and actually show you the Fusion middleware. And hopefully whenever you get that, do anything like this live on a um, webinar, you're Cross your fingers, make sure it works. Um, so basically, I've signed in. So if you, as soon as you install Oracle Business Suite 12.2, there will be a new URL. Um, so if you go to port 7001, becomes the default. In my case, it's 7002. Um, you log in with the WebLogic account, and then you basically go into the Fusion Middleware Control. And so the Fusion Middleware Control is a fairly complex uh, piece of software 
it allows you to basically go through and access many different parts of the web logic uh, configuration. So now if we kind of go in and we'll actually look in uh, go in and start looking at uh, how the Oracle HTTP server is configured. So this is the Apache server that runs and provides you the web access to the application. Again, if you're kind of looking at these screens, hopefully you're understanding, well, this, this thing's big. This thing's pretty complicated. Um, now if we go into administration and let's look at advanced configuration. The capabilities I have here to actually go start making changes and choosing files and change them is pretty dramatic. So let's look at the standard Apache configuration file. So the Apache is controlled by a file called httpd.com, and this controls the Apache configuration. So there's a lot of different security settings that we can put in here. We can enable or disable. Um, but here's an example of a file that if we look at the autoconfig node in it, um, autoconfig does the initial population, um, but this file is no longer managed by autoconfig. So now we can have the DDAs going in and actually making changes to this file. Um, there's no audit trail of them making changes to this file. There's no history. Um, they can actually now start disabling security settings, things like that. Um, so our concern now starts to become, for a security perspective, what can the DDAs be doing? They have to start working with this a little bit closer. Um, so that's just one example on the Apache configuration. If we start just looking at the application deployments uh, within WebLogic, um, this becomes very significant. It's, it's, there's a lot of stuff here, um, and unless you're a really good expert on the way um, WebLogic works and Fusion Middleware works, um, this can be daunting and very complex. Um, so we kind of look at some of the application deployments here. I can now go start adding in different web entry points, um, servlets, and things like that. So there's a lot of different things I can change in here. I can also start defining out web services. Um, unless you have a really good understanding how web services work, it's very easy. And we actually find are finding many more of our clients running web services who have no concept of how to secure a web service and are basically just opening up web services wide open. And because they don't understand how you can how easily you can access a web service. Um, they open up these web services by just kind of clicking. It's really easy. I can just go to find a new web service here, um, and I can enable it. But unless you understand the security aspects on how to configure the authentication to use eBusiness Suite authentication, I can basically now open up eBusiness Suite web services, and Oracle as part of 12.2 has offered up a lot of new web services capabilities. I can now open that up very easily, provide web services out, access to all of HR, uh, so people can just request HR information without any security. Um, so unless the, the DBAs get some training, have some understanding of how web logic works, um, it can become, um, start to become a problem. And there's not a, there's some auditing of changes within web logic, um, but there's not a lot, and that's not enabled by default. So there's no auditing of all the changes being made in here. Um, so you have to really enable a whole another layer of auditing and logging within the web logic's control capabilities to understand what's being changed. Um, and things like that. And then the question becomes, are these under change tickets? Um, every time a DBA has to come in here and make a change, hopefully they have a change ticket and some understanding of what's happening. Um, but typically, again, the DBAs are probably the ones going through and making the changes within the Fusion middleware. Um, so that's kind of just an overview of some of the issues and the concerns that we have related to the way Oracle 12.2 is using the web logic. It, it provides a lot of capabilities and things, but it's a very big beast now, um, and it, I don't think a lot of organizations are ready to handle the way the web logic works, and especially with the DBA teams they have today, to help manage it and do it correctly, and not potentially open up security flaws and holes in the application. So that's kind of a high level of the web logic. Um, so now we'll kind of touch base on a couple other points that we think are very important as part of eBusiness Suite 12.2, um, and these are mostly related to web security. Oracle, I would have to say, has introduced, this is, would be the web security release for eBusiness Suite. Um, they've kind of gotten serious about web security. They've added in some uh, industry best practices that have come out in the last few years um, that prevent things like click jacking, cross-site scripting. Um, so one of the first big features is called click jacking protection. Um, so click jacking. It's like 
capability to allow some third-party site, and this is probably a little bit of a contrived example, but basically if your boss is signed into eBusiness Suite, I could make a website and then have him access that website and embed within that website a button that I would get him to click on. And by him clicking that, I could then have it in uh, double my salary. Um, there's a couple things you can do like that. That's a little bit of a contrived example, but I think that's the scenario. So I need a third part. I need another web page that I can get my uh, boss or somebody to access. Or if you just think about it, is you might be running an iStore, and if I can kind of get a mirrored image of your iStore running, um, instead of having it at bigcompany.com, it's at bigcompany.cn, and someone because that's a Chinese domain name, I make my site look just like your iStore and then somebody comes in and I can actually now uh, steal your credentials for eBusiness Suite. Um, but by also embedding things within that website that go back to the original one, I can actually have you authenticate to the original one, bring back information, um, stuff like that, and you would never know the difference if you're, uh, because it's pulling back information from the real site. Um, that's basically called clipjacking. And so Oracle's added in a couple capabilities to stop that from working. So if a web page is accessed and it's actually coming from a frame from another web page on another site, um, previously Oracle would allow it. Um, click jacking protection actually blocks that. Um, so there's a frame, they call it frame busting, um, because basically you embed it in a frame. And so whenever you see a sophisticated website that has different panels on it, those are called frames. And so you just embed the site in one of those frames and then it goes back to the original site. Um, this is kind of a real down and dirty web security attack, uh, but these happen especially if you have a scenario like an iStore running that people can do different things they want, the login credentials and stuff like that. Um, PayPal and eBay are much more targets of quick checking, uh, but at least this gets Oracle up into uh, the 21st century on some major web security prevention techniques. Um, another capability is for quick checking protection. Um, Microsoft a couple years ago released the capability called X-Frame Options, and so this is another click jacking protection that basically says I really need to go back if there's a frame, I can't bring in frames from all different websites, I need it just for the website that it's all coming from. Um, so again, just another click jacking protection um, that Oracle had ignored for a number of years and has finally um, included. Um, these features all are all enabled by default, so you're kind of getting some decent protection. Um, another area, and this is probably one of the ones that we're a little bit more concerned about, um, especially if you're running uh, iRecruitment webs, uh, especially external sites that are allowing users to actually upload documents. Um, so the classic example is I'm running iRecruitment, and let's say there's a virus in a Microsoft Word file. And so when I actually upload the Microsoft Word file, then my recruiter grabs the Microsoft Word file, he opens up the Microsoft Word file, and the virus, the macro virus executes. Um, I'm assuming I don't have very good antivirus on the desktop or it's a brand new virus. Um, Oracle's added and very much enhanced the capabilities to virus scanning on all file attachments and uploads. Um, this is limited. You can only use it with a semantic server, but basically what happens now is in 12.2 is if I upload an uh, attachment, let's say as part of my recruitment, I'm uploading my resume as a document file, it will actually take that document file pass it off to the semantic antivirus server, uh, validate if there's any viruses, um, semantic will say yes or no, um, and if it detects a virus, it'll block the upload from actually happening in the business suite. Um, this is mostly useful for our recruitment and I supplier. Um, besides that, it's just another layer in, of defense and depth. Um, so you're just trying to block, okay, let's not get viruses because if someone can upload a virus in that recruitment, my recruiter opens it. Um, Again, a very easy way to actually infect an organization with a virus internally. Um, this also comes into advanced persistent threat. So anyone who's familiar around the security world for APTs, um, people from China and other foreign governments hacking uh, U.S. corporations, and this is one avenue they get in. They look for an avenue either sending out an email phishing attack or they do something like this by all I need to do is even, I don't care about the recruiter, I don't care about the person opening my resume that's got the virus, I just care that I get a foot hold into your environment. Um, so if you're any sort of organization that's very concerned about security, this is just another uh, layer of defense. A couple other web application security 
uh, additions, uh, cookie domains. Um, there's potentially a way to steal the eBusiness Suite session cookies. And for those of you not familiar with what a cookie is, um, since the web is stateless, I don't really keep a session to the web server. I request a page, I stop. I request a page, I stop. And the internet uses what they call cookies to basically allow you to go between two web pages to say, oh yeah, I'm the same person coming back and this is my session, so keep me going. Um, so those are called cookies. There's a possibility that someone can steal your cookie for an e-business e suite session and then use it externally. So let's say they go in and kind of attack your machine uh, because you're going to another website and they have some capability to steal your session cookie. Then they can actually sign on as you within the e-business suite. Um, so Oracle's added another layer um, that's set by default. Um, to the domain for session cookies. So session cookies can only be used from web pages that are accessing the domain. So if you're going to integrity.com, if I'm at another site, that site can't actually access my cookie within the browser. Um, so it just provides another layer of defense. Um, Oracle's added a number of cross-site scripting protections to the application. So whenever you do file uploads or attachments, um, you protect against cross-site scripting. Uh, Cross-site scripting is the capability that, um, especially a very good example is within the rich, the messaging rich text editor. So if I go into different modules, I think it's actually enabled in iRecruitment, I can actually type in a nice note in the browser in the window. So I'm doing my application, there's a nice uh, text editor that I can type a nice message in, I can actually bold it and put italics and things like that. And then what happens is that gets saved in the database and then the recruiter or someone actually opens that up. Well, a cross-site scripting attack is there's actually, I've embedded code within that. So instead of just a nice message, I've actually put some HTML code um, being JavaScript and that JavaScript then will get saved in the database and then when the recruiter opens up the iRecruitment application, they'll actually open up to look at the, what the person wrote and JavaScript will actually execute on their machine. And potentially I can then make an attack and actually potentially take over that person's machine or pop up a message that tells them to click. Uh, anyone who's ever gotten that message that pops up and says, ooh, you've got a virus, click here to actually download antivirus. Um, it's a pretty effective attack. A lot of grandparents fall for that one. Um, that's basically the type of attack that these cross-site scripting protections are uh, attempting to avoid, especially because, again, I'm, I'm on the external. I'm going to your iRecruitment site. I'm putting something in a bot, a message box, which then somebody in, internally on one of your inside systems is opening. They're seeing a message. It's probably not as a sophisticated user as I, an IT security person or a DBA. And they say, oh, I need to click that box or something else happened. And they can make it look exactly like a pop-up message from Oracle eBusiness Suite. They can make that message box look like the timeout message um, that pops up to say your session's timing out. Um, so they can make it look very realistic, and then when you click that, it it, it takes them to a web page um, that can do something else. Um, so th these are kind of very powerful attacks if someone's going after your organization, and Oracle's now added in these additional layers to help they prevent those. So that's kind of the new security features and enhancements as we've kind of gone through. There's some more, um, but those are really the some of the most important ones that we see from a security perspective. Um, there's some other areas within the application that we kind of, as we got, went through and looked at the new features and things, things that kind of triggered some red flags for us, things that said, ooh, I don't know if that's actually a great idea, or I wonder how um, our clients are actually going to implement that uh, to cause some problems. Um, one of the capabilities is Oracle's dramatically expanded um, the delivery manager. So now you can take output from eBusiness Suite and very easily send it through email, automatically upload it to an FTP server, um, save it to the local file system. All in all, sending out a nice general ledger report may not be the biggest deal, but don't forget there may be sensitive data within these reports. So now you're taking these reports and making it actually very easy to send them out by just doing a concurrent manager request. I might be doing a HR payroll report that's full of social security numbers and now I'm actually popping it into sending it very easily through email or sending it to an FTP server. Um, hopefully people aren't really using FTP servers anymore due to security concerns, uh, but some people might be. So that was kind of one area that, so when you're looking and talking about doing delivery manager and trying to now send off emails, always think about the sensitive data issue if you're just propagating those social security numbers, credit card numbers, and other sensitive information throughout the organization. 
Another area is Oracle, especially starting with 12.1 and even more so in 12.2, has dramatically expanded the capabilities of web services and the application. Um, you can do a lot of things now with the web services, and they're very powerful, very feature-rich. Unfortunately, what we've found is not a lot of organizations on the e-business suite side, or many organizations are very sophisticated in web services, but what we've actually been found is happening in a lot of organizations is, well, the Oracle team is doing the web services. They're not bringing in the top experts within the organization who know all about web services, well, oh, we, it's in the Oracle manual, we can figure it out, we can do it. Um, and what's happening is the security aspect is usually somewhat complicated to get working correctly the first time. And so what happens is they just turn off the authentication. So you get these web services because, and they don't understand how you can actually access them pretty easily by using some different tools. They're like, oh, those are so hard to use. How could anyone ever attack them? Um, so what they end up doing is just enabling web services, putting out HR feeds all over the place, and anyone can now come in and grab very easily a lot of sensitive data as long as you just know what the port number is. Um, and it becomes a web service with no authentication. Um, the authentication with eBusiness suite accounts and other authorization works really well. What we find is people just disable it. So a lot of Organizations don't know web services very well, and the people implementing in the e-business suite especially are not that conversant. Um, so that becomes a problem on the security side. Um, and finally, one security concern that we recommend every client, no matter what version of e-business suite you're running, is the Oracle application passwords have a huge, huge flaw. Um, by default, they're encrypted. And by encrypted means somebody can go in and decrypt them. So this common scenario is I've got a production environment, I clone it down to test and development, then I clone it to the development environment, which then I give out the apps, apps password to my developers. Oh, by the way, your developers can go in and decrypt all the production passwords because you haven't changed them when you did the clone, and then they can get all the production passwords and now go into production as those users. It's a very powerful attack. Um, especially for developers, now I've got full access, I can circumvent any application control because I've got everybody's password um, to the production system. And they might be reusing those passwords for other systems, so it becomes even worse. Oracle released the capability to hash the passwords. So they enhance the way the passwords are stored. Unfortunately, even in 12.2, Oracle does not do that hashed enhanced passwords at, by default. So no matter what version of eBusiness Suite, even, even in 12.2, you really need to be enabling the enhanced passwords. Um, if you just look for non-reversible password on uh, MetaLink, it'll pop right up with the notes that you need to look at. Um, but that's, we're kind of disappointed with Oracle that they did not enable that by default in 12.2. And so a very good opportunity on the default install to do it. Um, it's very simple to enable. You probably should do it in a test environment to make sure it works. Um, but it's one of those areas that is very, very easy to exploit. There's tons of information about it on the internet, um, and we find DBAs doing it all the time, uh, or especially developers, uh, <clears throat> decrypting the passwords just to see what they are, so they need to go into production as somebody. Um, so it's very easy to do, um, and it's still a problem in 12.2. too. So if there's one takeaway from this call, make sure that you actually are using the hash passwords in eBusiness Suite no matter what version you're running. And it's supported all the way back to 11.9. Um, so that was basically kind of a high-level overview of this new security features in 12.2. Um, kind of touched on the major ones. There weren't hugely significant changes or new features related to users, applications, roles, and responsibilities. Um, but there are some nice, especially around the web application security side. Oracle did some very nice improvements um, that were much needed in the application. <laughs> and so we'll open up to questions. Thank you, Steve. The the problem with the questions is that we really don't have any today. It probably has to, it probably has to do with uh, uh, your topic was so new that uh, uh, people had no basis for the, for the question itself. There was one on on licensing. I don't know if we want to tackle that or not. It seems to be a little bit out of our our scope. Um, yeah, that was that, that yeah. The question was: Are there any licensing issues when one upgrades to the 12.2. Unfortunately, that is definitely outside our scope. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't have a good answer for that one. I don't, I don't know of any. Um, yeah. The one 
I'm so completely unrelated to 12.2, so I don't know of any licensing issues related to 12.2. But Oracle recently did change the licensing for one of the um, key products that we really like. Advanced security option is a significantly expensive add-on that provides the capability for TDE and also provide the capability to encrypt SQL net traffic and also do authentication to external systems like Active Directory. Oracle has changed the licensing recently of advanced security options so that the SQL net encryption and the integration with external authentication like Active Directory are now free. TDE is still part of advanced security option requires a license and they've added in Oracle Redaction which is a feature we definitely love. Um, but the other two features, especially the Active Directory component, is fairly easy to set up, and you can actually now move away from having the locally authenticated database accounts for all different read-only accounts that other people you're adding in. Um, so that's one licensing change. Just for, since we're talking about licensing, um, we're definitely very happy about and are trying to help a lot of different clients implement today. All right. Thank you, Steve. I think this is going to conclude uh, today's uh, webinar session. Uh, be sure to stay tuned next month, that's April the 20th, for our next webinar e-learning session, which is EBS Security, Trust But Verify. So it sounds interesting. So thanks, everybody, again, for attending uh, today's webinar. Have a great rest of the day.